Hello, assalamu alaikum and good evening. Welcome to another episode of Health is Wealth. I am your host, Shibnam Riaz. Okay, and as we do every week at this time, we, you know, uh, choose a current health topic that we think is going to be relevant to our viewers. And we get lots of feedback from people as well. And they tell us about the things that they want uh, us to talk about. And the purpose of these programs, of course, is to, you know, create awareness and inform the public, inform viewers about the various, you know, health uh, concerns and issues that they should be concerned about. Today, we're going to talk about, among other other things respiratory problems we're also going to talk about you know what is the role of the internist as well in a, a person's life so for today's program we're very happy to have with us in the studios today professor dr intahab alam who is the head of department of medicine in lady reading hospital and the ceo of postgraduate medical institute Peshawar. thank you very much professor Zab, for joining us thank here you today for inviting me thank you okay um to start uh, today's program while we will go on to talk about respiratory problems and all the things that are associated there, I thought that it would be, you know, interesting to find out uh, the difference between what is actually the, res the role of a consultant physician right. as, you know, in... Uh, um, uh, in Specialists. As and, a, and yeah, the, and the difference between... And the, subject specialists. Yes. Yeah. Uh, to start with, uh, is, I think it's a good point to raise because the first person the public actually encounter for any problem in Western world is a GP. Mm. It's a general practitioner. Yeah. There's a membership or, uh, for MRC GP, which is called in UK. Mm. Uh, and these people are actually trained about each and every system in the body. They have mm. got some knowledge of each and every system. Okay. So they are a good, uh, you know, can screen the patient for mm. any problem and can then refer the patient to a proper specialist to which they think the patient is suffering from. Mm. So I think um, uh, I would like to distinguish here between a GP and an internist here. Okay. A GP has a graduation of a basic graduation mm. and an MRC GP while an internist is a fellow or the member uh, and they are you can call them medical specialists. Mm. Both have got the same knowledge but internists have an in-depth knowledge of, of, of the problem area. and they can have, they know more of the differential diagnosis and management issues can be can, can be addressed by an internist mm. better than a GP. So in this hierarchy, for example, I would say that first a GP should be consulted, mm. then they should or an internist should be consulted. And after going through the patient history and examination, they mm. are the best judge that what the patient is suffering from, which mm. system is affected, and which specialist, if at mm. all needed, mm. should the patient go to. Mm. Okay. So uh, is it... Uh, how, do, how does it work here then in our part of the world? How many sort of GPs do we have here or medical, you know, the, the Yeah, you know, um, uh, GPs should be the first, as I just mentioned, mm. should be the first doctor to, um, to whom the public should to consult with. And they sort of form a filtering mechanism mm. whereby they decide whether mm. they can handle the situation there and then mm. and thereby reducing the load on the secondary or the tertiary level healthcare system. Mm. Because GPs actually form the primary basic mm. healthcare system mm. and they should be uh, trained enough and should be competent enough to, to deal with any medical situation where intervention is not needed. Right. Similarly, in secondary level care system, we have internists, mm. or we call them diagnosticians nowadays, diagnosticians. or people generally call them consultant physician or medical specialist. Okay. They have got, they are only specialized in medicine, mm. and as I said, that they have got in-depth, vast knowledge of the problem, so they can actually think of more possibilities if the patient, because making a diagnosis is the first step of mm. managing a patient. Of course. If you can make a, a correct diagnosis, mm. hopefully the patient would end up having the correct management. Mm. If you make a wrong diagnosis, it's a dreadful thing because the because patient would outright go for a wrong management. And then afterwards, everything that is following yes. is on the wrong path. Yeah, it's on the path. Mm. So are, you know, would, would you say that patients are getting enough time? Uh, many doctors are, you know, they, they say that we have too many patients to see and the, there's yeah. a whole, the, you know, we can't give that much time. So how do we address that issue? You know, I think uh, experience gives you that cutting edge to a medical specialist who are very senior enough. Mm. And because he has been seeing patients for decades, so 
a medical specialist has that knowledge and experience mm. and expertise to diagnose just on site. Mm. Uh, yeah, this is this is what happens. That is the a... the, uh, the moment patients talk about two three words about their disease, right. the internist medical specialist has a diagnosis in their mind. In just a few words. Yeah, it is. How it does is. that work? As I told you, knowledge mm. and, the, and experience. Mm. I mean, there is no shortcut to experience. Mm, I'm talking about a person, a consultant physician, mm. who has been in a teaching uh, mm. profession. He's a, been a teacher, working mm. in a teaching environment, mm. and has been in contact with with CMEs and CPDs all his life. Mm. So these sort of internists, they are the gold mines of, uh, of our profession. Right. And such internists are able to diagnose. Right. As I told you, diagnosis is the, the stepping stone towards any management of any mm. disease. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I thought you know, was really interesting, because when we were talking before we were uh, recording, uh, before the um, actual uh, program. program right now, and I thought that was really, you know, it was, uh, very inspirational to hear you say that before we had all these tests and before we had all these things, yeah. you know, doctors were able to just talk to a of patient course. and then say, okay, you know, and have quite a, a, a knowledge of yeah, what's Yeah, I going totally on. agree with you because before this high tech medicine, we call it high tech, like CTs, MRIs, echocardiograms, and angiographies, and endoscopies, mm. everything. Mm. Mm. Now we are losing that high touch medicine. Mm. You know what high touch medicine is? We call it clinical medicine, okay. in which you would listen to your patient, mm. you will take a proper history, mm. and the basis of that history, you make a differential diagnosis, and then examine the patient, keeping that diagnosis in your mind, mm. and try to pick up signs mm. of that disease, mm. and you clinically diagnose. Mm. Believe me, if you take a proper history and examine the patient, 85 mm. to 90 percent of the times you are going to get the diagnosis without embarking upon any investigation. And that's a huge percent. Yeah, it is huge definitely. Percent. It can save a lot of time and money of the patient. Yeah, I mean, the, the so time, a lot of money uh, and actually save lives. Yes, because again, does. as you said, you end up going down the wrong path sometimes yes, when definitely. you have a misdiagnosis. Okay, we'll keep coming back to this aspect of this, um, you know, this subject in the show. Uh, we're going to talk about respiratory the respiratory system and you know complications the breathing as well first of all if you can just tell us a sort of a you know a brief um, description for our viewers for what the respiratory system yeah respiratory system uh, is the system through which we breathe mm. and we and why do we breathe because we need oxygen mm. you know there's 25 percent oxygen present in the atmospheric air mm. and so we actually breathe to take the oxygen inside uh, our lungs mm. where it uh, the uh, transport takes place, oxygen goes into the blood, carbon dioxide from the blood comes into the air, that is exhaled. Mm. So we breathe in oxygen and we uh, we breathe, for example, 21 percent oxygen. When we exhale, it has 15 to 16 percent oxygen. Mm. So we actually, our body extracts 5 percent of oxygen, mm. uh, which actually diffuses into the blood. Mm. And we need oxygen to live, to survive. Mm. Whatever we eat, it has to be combusted or, you know, it's a fuel mm. which has to be combusted. For that, we need oxygen. Mm. It is like any combustion engine, for example, mm. in mm. which the fuel is the petrol mm. and, you know, the engine sucks air the and then the combustion takes place in the combustion yeah. chamber and the piston starts working. Similarly, we need energy mm. and for that, we need to feed ourselves mm. and we have to t in, uh, uh, breathe mm. and for that Allah Ta'ala has made the system of respiratory system mm. which starts from our nose and mouth mm. and uh, uh, the nose and mouth either we breathe through our nose or mouth it goes through the windpipe or the trachea right. and which divides into mm. two the right main bronchus mm. and the left main bronchus mm. which divides and re-divides up to 32 to 34 times. My God, that's right. So, so, so just imagine a three centimeter pipe, when yeah. if you divide it up to 34 times, it ends up in a microscopic level. True. You can't see it with your bare eyes, naked eye, right. and you have to use a microscope to see those tubules through right. which air and, flows. And we are going to show you now a report which will you know, describe everything that uh, Dr. Salvin said. So let's have a look at that report. In order to stay alive, the body has to breathe air. We breathe in oxygen and we breathe out carbon dioxide. This process is known as respiration. Breathing happens automatically. Every day, the body breathes about 20,000 times. By the time we reach 70 years old, that's about 600 million breaths. All of this breathing occurs because of the respiratory system, which includes the nose, throat, voice box, windpipe and lungs. 
At the top of the respiratory system, the nostrils bring air into the nose where it's filtered, warmed and moistened. Tiny hairs called cilia protect the nasal passageways and other parts of the respiratory tract and filter out dust and other particles that enter the nose through the breathed air. Air can also be breathed in through the mouth. The two airways of the nose and mouth meet up at the pharynx, which is located at the back of the throat. The pharynx carries both food and air and is used for digestion and respiration. One path is for food. This is called the esophagus, which leads onto the stomach. The other side is for air. It's called the trachea. A small flap of tissue, called the epiglottis, covers the air-only passage when we swallow. This stops food and liquid from going into the lungs. The larynx, or voice box, is located at the top of the trachea, the air-only pipe. This is where our vocal cords are. The trachea, or windpipe, which is a two to three centimetre tube, then extends downwards from the bottom of the larynx for about 12 centimetres. The walls of the windpipe are made strong by stiff rings of cartilage that keep it open. The trachea is also lined with tiny hairs. They sweep foreign particles and fluids out of the airway, keeping them from entering the lungs. The windpipe divides into two branches, and each one of these enters one of the two lungs of the body. Each branch resembles the limbs of a tree dividing into smaller, finer branches called bronchioles. The bronchioles end in tiny air sacs called alveoli, which look a bit like grapes. These structures enable fresh air to get to the air sacs, which are surrounded by tiny blood vessels, or capillaries. The oxygen passes through these air sacs and travels through the capillary walls into the bloodstream. At the same time, carbon dioxide transfers from the bloodstream into the air sacs, where it gets breathed out of the body. When we exercise, the body needs more oxygen to feed the muscles as they work harder. The body responds by breathing more quickly and deeply. As the cells of the muscles use up more oxygen, the lungs have to work harder to keep up the supply. The respiratory system then speeds up to supply the body with much needed oxygen and also to get rid of the carbon dioxide waste in the system. Over time, exercising also helps our chest cavity to get bigger, which enables the body to increase the amount of air it takes in. More capillaries form around the air sacs, so the body gets better at swapping oxygen and carbon dioxide gases. OK, hope you found that report informative. Uh, Professor Alam, you know, you're going to explain something else about the respiratory system as well. Yeah, as I was just describing the anatomy of a uh, respiratory system, as I told you that the main bronchi divide and redivide up to 34 times before they end up in having microscopic uh, tubular structures we call respiratory bronchioles, mm. which open in a sac-like structure which we call alveoli. Mm. And just to give you an, um, just to use an idea and what is the purpose of these microscopic uh, alveoli and structures, mm. it increases the surface area mm. uh, with which the air comes in contact with the blood. Mm. And that surface Where area the is in an to... adult is yeah. of a tennis court. Mm. So that's why when the air comes in contact with the blood, mm. within a fraction of a second, the, uh, the transport of the gases takes place right. and the uh, air comes out. Mm. Now, the lining of these bronchi and bronchiole is, of, um, is a cuboidal epithelium, which mm. secretes also mucoid, which traps uh, mucus, I would say, and which traps dust and other particles and they are then brought up in the sputum mm. and therefore our respiratory tree remains clean. Mm. Uh, it is the basically the environment of this epithelium and the, the layer underlying this mm. in which the pathology or some problem takes place and the diseases like asthma and COPD mm. uh, and uh, also the disease involving the alveoli Mm. that the, these problems, respiratory problems take place. Okay. So like, you know, the way you've described it is very, very interesting to understand as well. Uh, basically, you're also saying that, you know, it's like a filter. And if something comes into that filter and the it starts filter getting... The starts from our nose. Ah, oh, right. Uh, this is our air conditioner, you mm. know. Okay. Because it warms the air, mm. it also traps the dust particles. Okay. And, uh, and then the clean air goes and enters. Down. But whatever, yeah. even smaller particles are left behind, mm. they are trapped by the mucus on the lining on the bronchial tree. And there are, Allah has made structure like cilia, we call it. They the propel, hair -like, they propel yeah. hair-like projections mm. and mm. they propel the mucus upwards, mm. which we either swallow or we 
Right. You're able to cough out. Spit it out. Okay, yeah, right. Breathing. Okay. So um, what then are the main diseases that affect our breathing system? And uh, how can we be aware to, you know, our surroundings, our environment, or yeah. other factors that... Uh, you actually pointed a very pertinent issue, that of environment. There are the three systems which uh, in our body which come directly in contact with the external environment and mm. that is the respiratory system, our GIT mm. and our eyes which are, you know, they are open to an external environment. Whatever we eat, or whatever we inhale, mm. actually our system it directly comes. Unfortunately, the humanity is paying a very heavy price for industrialization and the motor vehicle revolution which has taken place all over the world. Mm. And in the past uh, one century or so, uh, unfortunately, the respiratory system uh, diseases are on the rise mm. because of the pollution mm. which has been caused by industrialization and because of the exhaust fumes coming out of all these vehicles which are running on our roads. Mm. Uh, so. The air pollution, number one, is very important, which has a playing a vital role in increasing the prevalence and incidence of respiratory diseases. Okay, right. And, uh, uh, just to give you an example, the CO2 carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere was 280 parts per million in pre-industrialization era, mm. and now it is 410 parts per million. So mm. you can very well imagine how much CO2 level has gone up. Yeah. So I'm only talking about CO2, mm. what to talk about sulfur dioxide, carbon mm. monoxide. Mm. Another yeah, example to give you how much carbon monoxide is being expelled in the air, one gallon of gasoline when it is combusted in a motor vehicle engine mm. throws out six pounds of of uh, carbon monoxide mm. in the air. And then in our country, we don't have the regularization between the vehicles yes. because, you know, in, in uh, uh, places around the world, you have to have a fit vehicle that is, you know, giving out the right emissions and yes. we don't have that he going here. Yeah, and the authorities yeah. are there. Even, you know, there is also Environmental Protection Agency, mm. which is an uh, international agency, mm. which is responsible to take uh, such steps which mm. to reduce emissions from out from the factories mm. and for also from the exhaust fumes in the vehicles. Yeah. So there are protocols like Kyoto Protocol which every industry and industry has to sign mm. to make sure that their factories are not actually polluting the air yeah. or they take proper steps to reduce that mm. emission or make mm. to detoxify it before mm. they are emitted in the atmosphere. Mm. So. Uh, Gases like carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen oxide, mm. all these are gases which are mm. toxic gases mm. and if they cross and a certain released. limit, and this, yes. yeah. then we come to particulate uh, pollutants, mm. uh, which particles like for example um, emitted by volcano eruptions mm. or through in dust storms, and so in normal day life, we have this dust in the air. Mm. So this is a particular type of uh, pollution which is around us. Then third one is organic or allergens, mm. like pollen, for example. Mm. Uh, and similarly, the, the spores of so the molds we have. Islamabad sees so much of a problem in, this, in the allergy yeah, so, season. And so environment is playing a very vital role in leading to a rise in mm. the prevalence of respiratory problems, especially asthma and COPD. Mm. Uh, coming to asthma, for example, I would say, for example, in all diseases, two factors play a role, mm. genetic and environmental. Right. Like for example, take example of uh, obesity, take example of diabetes. Mm. Similarly, in asthma, mm. uh, for example, it's both the genes are involved and environment is involved. Okay. But as it is one, there's one saying, the genes load the gun, the mm. environmental factors play uh, pull the trigger. Uh -huh. right. okay. You may have the genes, but unless the, uh, the right or the wrong environment mm. is not there, mm. the disease mm -hmm. cannot actually emerge or take place. Uh, okay. So, so they it need is that environmental conducive. control. If you have got the genes, uh. the environmental control takes the precedence. Uh -huh. I mean, that must be there to reduce the incidence or prevalence of the So disease. there's going to be a catalyst there actually that sets exactly, things in motion. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So okay, now you've spoken about the genes and you've spoken about the environment as well. Is a person, can a person still develop asthma at any time in their life regardless of whether it's in their genes? Yeah, as I told you there are more than 100 genes which have been incriminated in the onset of asthma for example. Mm. And uh, yes, you're right. 
that uh, we have uh, both childhood asthma mm. and adult asthma as well. Mm. Um, less than 12 years or more than 12 years, mm. we divide asthma. Let, let's not talk about uh, asthma because it is a very common problem with a very high mortality if it is not properly treated mm. and because it has uh, on off uh, acute exacerbations in which the patient certainly becomes severely breathless mm. and uh, it is a uh, an uh, asthma it may prove fatal if it is not proved, uh, mm. treated uh, in time, mm. timely. Mm. So, in asthma, hmm. uh, both genetic factors and environmental factors take place. It may be a topic as, uh, asthma, which hmm. take place may take place in children less hmm. than 12 years of age. We, hmm. talk, we call it a topic, or extrinsic asthma, hmm. or it may be intrinsic asthma in which there is no like known allergen, but hmm. even then the patients go on to develop asthma because hmm. of their a complex uh, interaction between their genes and environment and the pollutants which I have just described uh, around us and very heavy uh, concentration in our air which we are breathing in. Hmm. So if I start from for example pregnancy, hmm. pregnancy has effect on the mother and the ch child uh, which is um, you know inside her womb. Hmm. If for example a lady smokes hmm. or has a psychological trauma, studies have shown that the chances of asthma in the child which is being reared in her womb mm. is high in mm -hmm. adult life. Mm. So and also the emotional, did you say? Yeah, emotional it, stress. Uh -huh. yeah, psychological the emotional trauma. stress will also yes. put the, the child... Uh, Secondly, coming down, mm. if the child has a C-section, if, I mean, if the child was born through a C-section, mm. not through normal vaginal delivery, mm. studies have shown the child is more prone to develop asthma in adult life. Right. Yeah, so normal vaginal delivery is a natural way of birth in which a lot of things take place. Mm. The lungs are squeezed and the amniotic fluid comes out and mm. the child is able to breathe mm. uh, um, freely. Mm. Then breastfeeding. Mm. Those child who are breastfed mm. have a less chance of developing asthma. Right. Apart from many, many other benefits of breastfeeding mm. coming only, we are talking about asthma. Mm. So let me see. Then childhood infections, respiratory infections like respiratory syncytial virus, and rhinoviruses. Mm. So try to save your child from such infections because mm. the respiratory infections are usually spread by droplet infections, we call them. Mm. When a patient sneezes or coughs out, he actually throws millions of droplets in the air which may contain virus. Mm. And any healthy children or person who inhales that drop those droplets can get infected. Mm. So these infections, especially RSV and rhinoviruses, mm. have shown to increase the chances of asthma mm. later in the life. Okay, so how does a person know if the, the difference between if they're having a cold or an allergy? You see, cold is uh, basically uh, influenza or common flu or cold is a viral infection. Mm. Usually viral infections are self-limited, mm. uh, limiting conditions which they improve within two to three weeks time at the most at the most three weeks time and we only need to give patients supportive care mm. they don't need antibiotics right fine if the patient has um, viral uh, rhinosinusitis mm. or viral pharyngitis or viral bronchitis mm. the patient only needs supportive care mm. although in some of the respiratory virus in childhood there is a role of antiviral agents mm. But generally speaking, in adults, if they have got common cold or influenza, mm. they only need to receive supportive therapy in the mm. form of uh, antipyretics mm. and painkillers mm. and to reduce their fever. Why do our people love to, you know, uh, um, have antibiotics? Why do they say, you know, until we have antibiotics, we're not going to feel no, better? Can you please, you know, educate our viewers about the dangers of yes, having of too self many antibiotics and self-medication? Especially self-medication, yeah. wrong injudicious use of antibiotics. Yes. I think it's the biggest curse of our present era mm. because we are losing a very important group of drugs, antibiotics, which actually would cure a lot of diseases. And we are because the bacteria are getting resistant to these antibiotics because of injudicious use, mm. because of, I mean, you know, there are quacks sitting around mm. who, and there's no, I would, uh, from this forum would, uh, uh, would uh, request the present government mm. uh, under the leadership of our worthy Prime Minister Imran Khan mm. to please legislate that the, the, the drugs should not be available without uh, RMP, registered medical prisoner prescription. Yes. 
the major issue of self-medication, why mm. is there? Mm. Because you can go to the pharmacy and you can Easily. take any, you can buy mm. any drug you like. But we are seeing tranquilizers and other drugs are being sort Similarly, of regulated. I mean, I would talk about, for example, anti-TB drugs. Mm. One mm. can go and buy one, two strips of anti-TB drugs because it contains an antibiotic, mm. which will cure your upper respiratory tract infection. Mm. But people take it uh, thinking it because the other guy had cough and got improved. So and somebody I will, ask will you tell somebody, you know, you have a cough, okay, take exactly, these. Exactly, mm. exactly. In our hujras and our drying rooms, people uh, prescribe each uh, other the drugs. I was, I got better. You take this way, and it'll be all right. Mm. And mm. then the major thing is availability, OTC of uh, over-the-counter availability of all the drugs. Mm. There's a list of drugs like in uh, FDA approved, mm. which is OTC should be available OTC, mm. like antiacids, for example, which mm. are not very harmful. Mm. Exactly. But I think um, important drugs, including antihypertensive, antidiabetics, and antibiotics, especially. Mm. I think they should be only made available and on, a, on, a on the production of a RMP prescription. Absolutely true. Um, you know, uh, you were speaking about the environment as well before. Mm. Uh, please tell you know our viewers as well that you know we're having the tree plantation drive, yeah. and many people Today are. Today it has uh, been started, and exactly. I'm really happy yeah. uh, that making yeah. Pakistan green again. Yeah, <laughs> That's a very good exactly. News. Yeah, this yes. is, uh, tell us exactly how this is going to directly affect the breathing and the respiratory yeah. issues. I think plantation, you know, would mainly have an effect on our greenhouse effect, mm. the global warming which is taking place, mm. right? Because it will reduce carbon dioxide. Basically, mm. it's the carbon dioxide mm. uh, which is responsible for global warming. Mm. So as I told you just a moment ago, the, it has grown up from mm. 280 parts per million to 410 parts per million. Mm. So it has considerably increased in concentration and that is responsible for greenhouse effect. Mm. So, plant, um, increasing trees and uh, making Pakistan green would definitely help in and overall the world, uh, which we should go for this drive, mm. it will definitely improve global warming. Mm. But it may aggravate pollen problem, for example, if, oh, yeah. uh, if there are a lot of mm. plants around you. Mm. Coming but then, to then they need to be uh, educated, you know, uh, plantations yes. then, yes. you know, and not have those trees that cause those. Uh, well, pollen is like, you know, uh, wherever the plants and the mm. pollen is, is, uh, would be there, mm. may not be associated with bigger trees or so, but mm. in smaller plants where there is pollination and the flowers are there, mm. flowering plants, mm. their pollen is very important. Right. Although in trees probably it is not will really mm. be a big issue. Mm. But coming to pollen, I'll come to the household allergens. Right. I mean, I talked about a bigger environment, mm. uh, environmental issue, mm. which is uh, affecting our ecosystem. Mm. Now, coming to the household allergens to which a patient is exposed to, one of these uh, 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 house dust mites, mm. uh, the animal dander, mm. you know, cats and uh, the pets and uh, like cats and dogs, mm. their dander when gets, uh, you know, their mm. par uh, small particles can lead to. And third is mold spores. Mm. Uh, in our kitchen, in our bathroom, we mm. have got that green mold. Uh, uh, the spores of that can lead to allergens. Right. And uh, finally, cockroach dust. Cockroach so, dust. Oh, yeah, this, mm. if they die and they are, they are um, you know, um, powered. So that can lead to mm. allergy. So okay. environmental control at, the, at your household mm. level, mm. environmental control at your community level, mm. and a global level. Mm. So we, there are three levels in which a person, for example, a person can have a control on their household environment. Of course. It doesn't, cannot control the global environment or your mm. country environment. That is the job of authorities and EPA to think about it and WHO to think about it, how to control that. Mm. And uh, so these things, if for example, somebody is asthmatic, Mm. And if they have got a pet like cat or a dog, they mm. should think of, I mean, removing that from the house. Definitely, definitely. Removing that. And they also say they get rid of your carpets. Yeah, carpets are also, if the, for example, house uh, is carpeted, mm. remove that. Remove that, because that's where your, uh, your mites are going you to settle? vacuum clean it regularly. Mm. Okay. Fine. The another way, if you cannot, if you don't want to remove, mm. so then you vacuum clean it uh, regularly, mm. at least twice or thrice a week. Mm. And similarly, your uh, bed covers and pillow covers should well. also be like uh, they should be properly cleaned, mm. properly dusted, and mm. so and vacuum clean again. Mm. Um, so changing, for example, pillow cover may help you reduce your uh, nighttime symptoms in asthma. Mm. Okay, right. 
Um, as you, you know, you spoke about the uh, the things that a person can do in their home, yeah. and these are those intelligent things that you need to be doing because why would you want your health to suffer the, this way, you know? So, um, how do we increase this awareness? What do we need to do? We need more programs. We need the media to be proactive. What what, what should be done? You see, we have got a, um, a lot of platforms now. But previously, it used to be only print media or a TV. Mm. Now we have social media. Social media, fine. And uh, we have we can actually upload smaller clips made at the institu uh, at the institutional and the government level mm. for public awareness that uh, this is how you can actually control your local environment. Mm. Hygienic principles should be adopted, and mm. keeping yourself house clean, of course, is mm. the primary uh, requirement of Islam as well. Mm. And personal hygiene should also be addressed uh, as well. And those I just mentioned uh, to you, these allergens should be removed. Mm. For example, strong odors, for example, perfume. Okay. If you think that you are allergic to certain, or mm. generally speaking, perfume, avoid mm. them. Mm -hmm -hmm. And similarly, smoking. Mm. Of and course. I will talk about both if you are smoking, okay. active smoking, and passive and smoking then as passive well. Passive or secondhand smoking. Right. We will get back to that. Yeah. But right now, we have to go for a break. Don't change the channel. Okay, welcome back. Now, before we went to the break, we were speaking about asthma. Uh, so, uh, Professor Alan, please tell us what are the symptoms of asthma? Yeah, the viewers must be uh, wondering what asthma is. Most of, uh, asthma is a very common problem. As I just described in the anatomy, there, there are smaller tubules which take the air up to the place where diffusion takes place. Mm. So, if uh, it's an anybody's guess that if the tubule becomes narrow, Mm. The air flow through the tube will, will be I mean, more compromised. Higher resistance will be mm. offered. Mm. So, what happens in asthma and COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, mm. that the smaller bronchioles, that the microscopic uh, the tubules which mm. conduct the air, mm. they get narrowed. Mm because of the disease process in which the inner lining is affected mm. be, um, because of the allergy mm. there is inflammation takes place which leads to swelling of these uh, inner uh, layers and there is also we have got smooth muscles mm. in the which can actually lead to contraction of the tubules as well okay. so we call it bronchospasm okay so when the tubules are uh, um, constricted because mm. of bronchospasm mm. and the thickening of the inner layer, mm. so the internal diameter becomes very narrow. Mm. And is that when we see a, an asthmatic person yes. coughing so and what wheezing? Happens, and what will be the consequence mm. is that the patient will have difficulty in breathing mm. and they will have tightness in the chest, mm. they will have dyspnea or shortness of breath mm. and on there will be audible wheeze, mm. a whistling sound coming out of the chest and mm. they will have an intractable cough. Mm. So these are the mainstay of the symptoms of diagnosis of asthma. Tightness in the chest, breathlessness, mm. cough, and wheezing. Mm. So, these are on, on the basis of this, mm. what is the difference between asthma and COPD? Mm. COPD is basically smoking related. Okay. There are two chronic bronchitis and emphysema okay. that we, we, they, we group them in COPD. Asthma is basically not, as to speak, smoking related, although it may get aggravated by it. Mm. So, that is the difference in the definitions mm. that asthma is an allergic or maybe a topic or non atopic condition mm. in which there is hyper responsiveness mm. of the airways. Two allergens, two particles to which a normal person may not respond, mm. their airways respond and they go into bronchospasm okay. or inflammation takes place of mm. the inner wall, mm. which leads to thickening, mm. leading to narrowing. In asthma, this is reversible. Mm. In COPD, it is gradually deteriorating. Mm. That, that is the main difference between asthma. So, we diagnose asthma if any child or an adult presents with these symptoms mm. and on treatment, we are able to show reversibility. Mm. There are few tests which can be conducted, spirometry or a peak expiratory flow rate. Mm. I mean, that's a simple instrument in which the in patient which goes very uh, mm. uh, fast and we uh, uh, record the peak expiratory flow rate, how much it is. And that is actually um, compared with the predicted value for that age uh, and uh, weight and, and race and sex of the patient. Right. So that's how we diagnose asthma. Mm. 
Right. This is the mainstay of treatment of the of the diagnosis of asthma. Right. Okay. Uh, you mentioned, you know, that the a person goes into spasm and yeah. you have the bronchospasm and everything, and this is brought on by certain factors, as you described. Can uh, emotions, uh, stress, yes. can that also cause? Yeah, emotional stress, exercise, for example, can uh -huh. precipitate an acute attack of asthma, mm. uh, in which suddenly the airways, as I just described, become very narrow. Mm. So it, mm, the patient feels it very difficult to breathe in, mm. and especially to breathe out. Yeah. Where the wheezing especially is more prominent on expiration rather uh -huh. than inspiration. Right, right, right. Because there's more pressure when we are mm. actually exhaling, so mm. the bronchia, bronchioles and bronchi are more mm. likely to get uh, constricted or become more narrow during expiration. Right. So yes, emotional stress can precipitate uh, bronchial asthma. Bring on it, right. Okay. So next step, we, the diagnosis is done and the treatment. Then we, you know, we classify asthma. Hmm. As I told you, um, atopic, non-atopic, intrinsic, extrinsic, hmm. depending on what allergens are involved. Are there any identifiable allergen present? or environmental, environmental factors which are present, mm -hmm. which may be actually contributing to the onset of the disease, mm -hmm. they are controlled. And then we uh, classify it according to the severity of asthma. Mm -hmm. How frequently the attacks are coming, how severe are the attacks, mm -hmm. how much it is going, uh, affecting the daily chores of the patient, mm -hmm. and whether they are taking days off mm -hmm. uh, from their work because of the disease. Mm -hmm. So all, on all these, we classify as mild, uh, moderate, and severe. Okay. Right. And then on the basis of that, we prescribe treatment. Mm. Nowadays, the mainstay of treatment is our inhalers. Okay. People have an undue, you know, fear about inhalers. They mm. think that they are ashamed of using it or fearful of using inhalers, although this is the best treatment for asthma mm. because, as I just described in the whole program, mm. okay, it is the disease of the airways. Mm. So, in inhaler therapy, you mm. take the drug directly into your airways where right. it is more effective and instantly effective. Mm. If you take a tablet, first mm. it will be get absorbed, yeah, it, will be, the um, uh, it will be absorbed in the blood, mm. then will come, will be pumped, pumped to the, through the body, mm. come a little bit of it will come to the lungs and mm. where it will be effective. Mm. So it will, be, it will take time and that would lead to a lot of side effects. Right, whereas the inhaler is going straight Inhalers to where the problem the is. Inhalers have the least side effects and they're more effective and right. instantly effective. Right. So we, f this is the mainstay and uh, I would not go to, go to into the details of the drugs which are used anyway. Mm. Uh, I mean beta agonist drugs and steroids mm. are the mainstay in which in, uh, meter dose inhalers, MDI as we call mm. them, one can take it directly. Mm. I would stress here that the doctor should spend time in teaching the technique of using inhalers. It's so what important. the doctors do, they only prescribe inhalers without teaching the technique. Mm. I think more and more time uh, should be spent by doctors in teaching the technique. Mm. If it is only, uh, and just to tell you, if it is properly taken, mm. only 20% enters in the airways where it is needed. Uh, if it is properly, properly taken, taken, only 20% is deposited in your, where it is not needed, okay. that space we call right, it. Right. Fine? So the, if, if the patient is not taking it properly, it's useless. It's useless. So basically they're just going through a mechanical procedure yes. and they're thinking that they, you know, treating the asthma, whereas yes. actually they are having no medication. You know, it's actually the timing. Before, right. when you actually come, uh, press mm. the uh, the uh, MDI and you breathe in, and you breathe in. Mm. If the timing is wrong, mm. the uh, the whole uh, all the medicine is deposited in your pharynx, mm. where it's not effective. So then there's a spacer device as well. Are yes. they ha helpful? Yes, then? yes, yeah. for children, for elderly people, mm. and somehow our uh, people are mm. they they don't learn it very well. Mm. So we advise them spacer devices mm. in which. They don't have to time in mm. which they actually uh, uh, compress the inhaler and the drug comes into the spacer device mm. and they can take three to five deep inhalation mm. from that spacer device right. and the drug is delivered to the airways. And when, you know, while we're talking about this, we're also going to show our viewers on the screens as well what is the right way of taking yep. an inhaler so that it can give you the maximum benefit. So we're going to show you that on the then screens as well. Then there are third type of, in which we call them revolizers, in which you put a capsule and you rotate the device, the capsule is broken, the mm. drug comes out and then you actuate or inhale it. Mm. Then finally there are nebulizers. Nebulizers. Nebulizers are electrically uh, um, uh, driven machines mm. which um, produce um, 
from fluid, uh, mm -hmm. from fluid they pro uh, produce, nebulize the drug, and small particles are pr uh, produced which are then inhaled by the patient. It is given through a nebulizer mm -hmm. where the drug is delivered into the mask and the patient is normally breathing mm -hmm. and through the breath the drug is taken in. Mm -hmm. So these are the mainstay of treatment of asthma and according to the severity of the disease, mm -hmm. you decide what drug, what type mm -hmm. of drug, what dose and mm -hmm. how frequent we should give them. Right. And patients, uh, family must be educated in, for example, if somebody, some child has an acute attack of asthma, mm. I think the, the treatment should start there and then at home. Okay. And the, the parents and the family members should know what to do in, in the case of acute attack of asthma. What is it that they have for to do? For example, if somebody is using a spacer, mm. you can call them, uh, tell them that uh, you can, you can, the patient can be given every 20 minutes. Every 20 minutes. Very frequently. Okay. Uh, every 20 minutes. And the patient should be uh, in a sitting up position, patient should be well hydrated. And, but um, of course, delay should not take place b before the patient shifted to the hospital. emergency department right. of hospital. Mm. I mean to say that there and then at home, the treatment should start so that the patient does not deteriorate to the uh, point where it becomes irreversible. Mm. Uh, what are the, you know, uh, sort of uh, the dangers of an asthma attack and you know, acute attack of asthma can prove fatal mm. if it's not proven, uh, if it's not treated properly. Mm. Mm. That's why I am stressing on the timing of initial early treatment starting mm. even at home. Mm. And so in the differential diagnosis, I'll come for example, mm. if the patient usually as a known case of asthma who develop acute attack of asthma. So actually on the patient's medical record, it is written diagnosed case and patient is on certain treatment. Mm. So the doctor's teams uh, know mm. that what the patient uh, is suffering from and what action should be taken. Mm. But for example, it may be the first take mm. of a patient. Mm. So in the adults, for example, acute myocardial infarction, mm. um, heart attack, uh, that mm. should be taken in mind, mm. should be kept in mind, acute exacerbation of COPD mm. should be kept in mind. And you know, um, asthma and COPD can, ex can exacerbate because of any infection. So okay. if the patient is febrile, is coughing up uh, purulent uh, greenish sputum, so it mm. means the patient has some attack and then antibiotics mm. play a role okay. as well. Mm. So apart from bronchodilators mm, administered through these various uh, uh, devices, mm. and in acute attack, we resort to parenteral therapy. That is either we give them IV, okay. intravenous, or okay. intramuscular therapy. Okay. And we increase the, uh, the frequency of uh, either through the spacer device mm. or nebulization. And monitoring is, the, is very important. The doctor is concerned, who is, whosoever is the, in charge of the patient, mm. must monitor the patient through peak expiratory flow rate okay. hourly mm. and should see the response of the therapy being given. Right. Because we have to upgrade or step up the, uh, the, the treatment if the patient is not responding to certain treatment. Right. So, right. Okay. Yeah. What about pregnancy and asthma? Pregnancy, because you know, um, because of the fetus inside, and there's a, a lot of, uh, I mean, you know, the space and the diaphragms are pushed up, mm. and therefore the capacity of the lungs also reduce. Mm. So um, they can take place, and because the capacity of the lung is uh, is low, mm. so they are they are prone to aggravate quickly. Mm. So uh, more prompt treatment mm. and more aggressive monitoring and treatment should be given to mm. patients uh, to ladies. A pregnant, pregnant. woman can take inhaler. Yeah, they can. Uh -huh. Yeah, they can. Okay. The right. beta uh, agonists and steroids are not contraindicated in pregnancy. Right. So, but but they should be mindful of the fact that they are, you know, uh, having their asthma in control. It's very yeah, important. Must be. Must be. I so, think that's a very important thing, isn't it? Uh, sometimes, you know, as a nation, when we talk about our mindset, sometimes we will, you know, be of the mindset that we'll we'll rush to the hospital when it's, you know, we're really the pain is out of control or we've been suffering for a long time. So how do you make people proactive to understand that it's... Education is extremely important, the patient personal education mm. and the family education. Mm. Especially the patient's family must be educated mm. in any disease, in a chronic long-term disease in which there is no cure but the patient is being managed. Mm. So patient family should be taken on board mm. and the patient must be also mm. be you know educated enough Mm. that they should uh, understand the disease, they should also be able to identify the early signs of acute attack of bronchial asthma, for example, mm. and they should act in mm. time. Right. Okay. Now coming to prophylaxis, mm. uh, in COPD, for example, in uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, for example, yearly influenza vaccination, pneumococcal, haemophilus type B vaccination, mm. um, which is given yearly, uh, has uh, been reported to reduce at acute attacks of uh, exacerbations both in COPD 
and asthma patients. And if the patient has upper respiratory tract infection, they mm. should be managed very aggressively mm. uh, and should be seen, uh, seen by a doctor mm. because acute infections and uh, can, can precipitate acute attack of asthma. And a chest x must be done to, uh, to exclude pneumothorax. Um, doctors know what I'm talking about. Mm. And fungal infection. Mm. So all these are the things in which the patient is holistically, mm. uh, you know, should be managed. Right, right. Okay. Um, the, we, unfortunately, we've reached the end of the program. It's been fantastic having you on and um, so many important things that have been shared and I'm sure the viewers have really gained by your expertise and thank, thank you, you very so much. much. And finally, you know, the uh, NIH also pro, um, offers vaccination desensitization. Mm. They test for the allergens to mm. which the patient is allergic to mm. and they give them a desensitization. That can be tried mm. in, in patients who are uh, got right. allergic asthma. Right, okay. Thank you. And just before we go, one quick message for the viewers for them to, you know, take their health uh, seriously, what should they be doing? Yeah, as I said, environmental control and personal hygiene, and at least you can control your household environment. True. And cleanliness is very important, mm. and uh, you should be able to identify the allergens present in your environment which may be making you yeah. worse or yeah. precipitating the disease. And finally, education is very important that I think everybody must get educated and family uh, involvement of family in such diseases is extremely important because they are the people who can actually first give them first aid treatment at absolutely, home. Absolutely, absolutely. Professor Dr. Indakar Balam, thank you very much for joining us here today. Thank you very much. For okay, and that, with that, we come to the end of today's program. As we always discuss in every program, you know, the main thing is to take yourself seriously, take your illness seriously, and, you know, adapt. As uh, Professor Alam said, you can control the environment at home. You can control things that are around you. What you can do, please do that. Take your health seriously. And until next week, stay happy, stay healthy. Bye-bye.